Hi, everybody, and welcome to the very first edition of the Jane's Terrorism and Insurgency podcast. My name is Matt Henman. I'm the head of the Jane's Terrorism and Insurgency Center. I'm delighted to be joined by fellow members of the team. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriella Serrano. Hi, guys. My name is Heather Nysel. Hi, uh, Olivia Harper here. I should mention right from the start that due to the ongoing global pandemic that we are all speaking from self-isolation. Everyone is dialing in remotely, so the sound quality and fidelity is perhaps below the normal standards that we would like, but we are going to soldier on. It's an exciting time at JTIC. We've just done a major relaunch for our product set and our website. Uh, we also recently published our 2019 annual attack index, and we have free to view versions available. Links to all of that content will be in the episode description or go to janes.com forward slash terrorism. A lot of our recent focus has been on groups that subscribe to very extreme neo-Nazi accelerationist ideology. So three of these groups in particular, so the Atomwaffen Division, the Sonnenkrieg Division and the Feuerkrieg Division, which are US and UK based extremist neo-Nazi groups, have all published propaganda depicting and encouraging uh, extreme violence against individuals and groups perceived as enemies. Within the last two months, though, all three of these groups have announced their disillusion via online channels. And we've provided assessments into how they're likely to continue to function both from an operational and a communication perspective. We've also done some work looking at the manifestos produced by prominent lone actor assailants, uh, most notably the Christchurch attacker, but perhaps most recently the attacker in the German city of Hanau in February. But I'll throw it over to some other members of the team to chat about some of the other key thematic areas we've been looking at with the product. On the other end of the ideological spectrum, we've also looked at the output of left-wing extremist and anarchist groups. While all these groups espouse anti-state rhetoric, some emphasize anti-corporate, anti-capitalist, or environmentalist messages. Others subscribe to even more extreme ideologies, such as the eco-nihilist group Individualidad Defendiendo lo Salvaje, or ITS, which is opposed to civilization itself. Um, we've also recently analyzed communications released in November of 2019 by a Chilean anarchist group called Asamblea Libertaria de Santiago during anti-government protests across the country. This collection of essays and one poem entitled War of the Classes was aimed directly at those protesting and actually was very optimistic in calling for an alternative political and structural approach to alleviate social issues, and namely the creation of regional assemblies. Of course, JTIC also covers a plethora of propaganda disseminated by militant Islamists. Alongside detailed and regular analysis of Islamic State media releases, we also cover propaganda distributed by Al-Qaeda's various branches and affiliates. Moreover, our coverage of Islamist militant media also extends to Shia Islamist militant groups, such as Iranian backed groups in Iraq, Syria, and the Houthis in Yemen. JTIC aims to constantly monitor insurgent media releases in order to maintain an accurate picture of the issues militant groups choose to discuss in their media. As such, we've been looking at the way non-state armed groups have been messaging in the past couple of months around the very topical subject of COVID-19. So whilst tracking the rhetoric of a number of groups, we've come across a lot of chatter. Heather, um, what have you come across in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, I mean, we're certainly not the only ones to be consumed by COVID-19. Um, there's been a lot of chatter with militants. So Hezbollah has been hit hard by the virus. Um, we've been monitoring the group's output and there has been nothing yet although our sources have indicated otherwise. They have reported a conscious media effort to downplay the impact of COVID-19, but I'd imagine this issue will likely become too big for the group to keep quiet. Yeah, so the Houthis have actively responded to the crisis. Since the 15th of March, schools under government control across Yemen have been closed as a precautionary measure. Um, and Ansar Allah has similarly called upon schools in areas under its control to be closed and are alleged to since have instrumentalised the educational vacuum to enrol students in newly opened camps for child recruits, similar to its summer camps, hence influencing and recruiting young militants to bolster its ranks instead. Yeah, the Taliban referred to the virus as a curse from God, but also bizarrely advised people to heed the warnings of the US's Centre for Disease Control. On pro-Islamic state media platforms, users have also expressed pleasure in seeing the Chinese government getting a taste of its own medicine being punished for its oppression of the Uyghur community 
This idea of revenge has also been noted when users have stated that enemies of the Islamic State were being punished for their crimes against the Ummah. This is particularly common in discussion of Iran and Shia Muslims in general. Yeah, we're also aware of white supremacist chatter about the issue online. Um, so US government, as well as our colleagues here at Jane's, have noted talk on far-right channels on Telegram, urging individuals who have contracted the virus to spread it to non-white groups and law enforcement personnel. Um, quite grossly, one thing we've come across is um, the advice on spitting on door handles. Um, so in order to both target their enemies and hasten the collapse of society. Another good example of this COVID-19 related messaging comes from Indonesia and the Philippines and allows us to pivot to the main topic of our podcast today, Islamist militant media in Southeast Asia. On hand to help us delve deeper into this issue is a regular contributor, Judith Jake. So without further ado, we're very excited to welcome Judith, an expert on Southeast Asian militancy, onto the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Could you just introduce yourself to our listeners and give a quick rundown of your areas of expertise? So I am a political and security risk analyst. I generally cover Southeast Asia, and I am also pursuing a PhD in the ideology of militant Islamism, specifically in Indonesia, at the London School of Economics. Excellent. Thanks again for joining us. As we've just mentioned, we've noted that a number of Indonesian and Filipino Islamic State-linked accounts on Facebook, Instagram and Telegram have been urging their followers to conduct attacks or prioritise jihad during the current upheaval caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Can it be said that this is the current propaganda focus of militant Islamist groups in Southeast Asia? I suppose it is a way of them grafting on a larger ideological message to a current event. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the mainstay because that would imply that there is a coherent and hierarchical messaging organization or communications team for pro-Islamic state groups or any other militant Islamist group in the region. And that doesn't really exist. These are often individuals who are supportive of the Islamic state and their aims and are simply using messages put out by official Islamic state media groups and grafting their own agendas onto that. So a good example of this would be that in Indonesia, there has been a long-standing backlash against the government for failing to speak up against the Chinese government's treatment of its Uyghur population. And that is in sense both militant and non-militant Islamists alike in the country. And so a lot of the messaging around COVID-19 is kind of like, ha, serves you right, China. Like this is Allah's punishment for you treating the Uyghurs badly. Or similarly, where there is dispute with Shia communities, these groups will often point to the fact that Iran has been hit badly by the virus. And as a result, it's again a sign of Allah's wrath for them straying from the true path of Islam. So these Islamic state linked channels would be the key players in this discussion then? They are one of the key players because there are many non-militant Islamist channels that are also propagating similar messages. And there is often, um, there isn't rather a clear distinction between uh, these two groups, because a lot of the ideological framework that they subscribe to is shared. And so you get very, very conservative messaging from both sections, and they will borrow from the same sources. The one will obviously um, not put out explicit calls to violent action in the way that Islamic State supporters would. And Judith, what are the most common platforms for publication used by players in the region? The most common platforms are, I suppose, like they are in most places. Uh, Telegram is the main channel for pro-Islamic state media. And you will also get uh, a fair bit of information on Facebook, on Instagram, particularly Instagram stories, uh, because that obviously disappears and it's harder to monitor and flag. Twitter obviously plays a huge role. And to a lesser degree, YouTube. Okay. And are there common themes in militant propaganda across the region? Um, does it differ from country to country? Yes, it really does. There isn't, like I was saying earlier, an overarching structure for Southeast Asian militancy. There's no group that sort of unites the region in the way that it would perhaps in Syria and Iraq. But for example, the Indonesians... The, the sort of media that they like to share tends to be old Islamic State videos, often with Indonesian subtitles added, old articles from the Beak magazine, and an emphasis there on showing that 
the caliphate was real and should continue to exist. So the messaging tends to be about emphasizing that there is a generation of young Indonesians who will grow up to become part of this caliphate. So they use the term generasi khalifa in a lot of these messages. There is a lot of emphasis on showcasing successful attacks from various Islamic state affiliated groups around the world and not necessarily a focus on the Southeast Asia region. And this, in I, I think, is a, a means for them of getting around the fact that the Indonesian groups have not been successful in staging attacks on home soil for a very long time. Their capabilities tend to be very limited and showing that they are part of a wider, more successful organization is a means of keeping supporters interested and engaged, even though the physical caliphate does not exist anymore. Conversely, in the Philippines, you will find that because groups there have got some territory, often in the southern Philippine islands, that they will showcase pictures of fighters in their camps, often posing with their guns or training with their brethren. They will often film shootouts with the Philippine armed forces, detonating roadside bombs, and a, an emphasis on their own activity and success within the Philippine context. So there's, there's a de-emphasis there on the international framework. Okay, great. And a group that we'll come on to later, the Abu Sayyaf group. So I've seen that they've released a lot of videos and statements for kidnap and ransom videos. Do a lot of other groups in the region do similar? No, because I think that the Abu Sayyaf, and I think we need to be careful about how we talk about groups in the Philippines, that the Abu Sayyaf is a network of networks. So when we talk about kidnap for ransom, that could apply to groups who have just gone straight into pure criminality. And then there are groups who use the funds from their kidnap for ransom activities to fund more militancy. And these groups often intersect and support or often compete with each other for mainly the same pool of money. Uh, when it comes to kidnap for ransom actions. And even then, you'll find that when it is an attack that is conducted or a kidnapping that is conducted for purely financial purposes, regardless of whether the group is focused on criminal activity and like the drugs trade or on militancy, they will perhaps capture Malaysian fishermen for small sums of cash that sort of thing they will not publicize because there's no point in publicizing that. It's petty, it's small, it won't gain you kudos from potential followers or potential recruits. But it's the bigger kidnappings, particularly when there is a Westerner involved or a foreigner. So if they manage to kidnap a tourist from a holiday resort on one of the Philippine or even a Malaysian island in the Sulu Sea, that becomes big news. But they haven't done one of those operations in a fairly long while. I think the last beheading of a Westerner took place in 2017. And I think that was a German tourist who was captured. That's really interesting. And in recent years, what have been the most notable developments in militant propaganda from Southeast Asia that you have identified? And what insights have tracking this provided? So again, I would sort of break that down into a sort of country by country analysis, because like I said, there's no overarching trend for the region. And I think it needs to be emphasized that there are linguistic differences that make it very difficult for Filipinos in particular to access Malay language material that the Indonesians and the Malaysians, because of the shared language of Bahasa Melayu, Bahasa Indonesia, um, have greater access to. And more importantly, when Islamic State had a more, um, had, a, had a greater output of propaganda material, there, that material was almost solely translated into Bahasa Indonesia or Bahasa Melayu um, and not into any of the multiple regional languages that exist in the Philippines. Um, so the sharing of resources in that sense makes it very difficult to come up with like a coherent regional common strategy, if you will. Um, so the main um, trends I've seen in the region, I suppose, in, in Indonesia specifically, let's start with that, um, have been, uh, frankly, a decline in the level of content because they were, frankly, quite dependent on Islamic State for new material. And since the fall of the physical caliphate, that has led to a 
dearth of new propaganda to put out. So what they've been doing instead over the last few years is repurposing or repackaging existing material and perhaps dubbing it or translating it into Indonesian if it wasn't already done so before, or taking existing articles from Dabiq and translating those or resharing those that were translated amongst their followers. Again, the overarching motivation for doing so is to show that the caliphate was an actual entity because the Indonesians who support Islamic State believe that this is fundamentally about praxis, unlike those who support Al-Qaeda, and about showing that we have actually physically done this. And that is what they want to emphasize, that there is a future for this. And it's not about waiting around to see for the right time, like this was the right time to establish a caliphate and to inspire future generations to perhaps attempt to reestablish this soon, if possible. Conversely, in the Philippines, after the siege in Marawi in 2017, a lot of the propaganda material was footage from that siege, because there was a lot to draw on there. It was a very, very successful and a huge uh, attack for the region. And the fact that they played a central role in it, rather than like, let's say, the Indonesians or the Malaysians, obviously meant that it was a gold mine for recruitment and propaganda within their, their own societies. More than that, they have had a steady stream of attacks in the last few months. So there are routine shootings where they engage the Philippine armed forces, or they target local Christian minority groups, or even they go after symbols of the state or civil servants. And that makes for a continuous fodder of um, propaganda. Great. Thanks so much, Judith. Given that you said that there's no overarching theme for the region or trends, what is the current trajectory of militant Islamism in Southeast Asia? And how do we anticipate this changing over the coming six to 12 months? Well, I suppose the world is in flux at the moment, so making long-term predictions is a little hard. Um, I would say that with the Filipinos currently, since the death of Isnilon Hapsalon, who was the emir of the East Asian province of the Islamic State in the region, at the end of the Marawi siege in 2017, the remaining IS groups in the region, let's say, like broadly speaking, there are three in the Philippines, um, IS Lano del Sur, we can call it that, IS Jolo, and uh, IS Mindanao, to broadly categorize the three big factions there. There are obviously many, many smaller groups, because like I said, the Abu Sayyaf is a network of networks, and then there's the BIF, and there's a whole alphabet soup of other groups operating there. Their fighters still have significant financial resources, having taken money and other stores of wealth from Marawi itself. And they have financial links with Malaysian benefactors and others from overseas. And they have access to weaponry, as we can see from the ongoing attacks, as well as the skills to conduct those attacks. So I would say that the threat from these groups remains very high. The only question is, is whether the unity between the various factions will hold and whether or not the current leadership will be able to motivate the fighters to try again to establish a large unified territorial stronghold, because that still remains an aim. But whether or not people are satisfied with the credibility of the leadership, unlike uh, Hapilon, who had long-standing links with all of the various factions and was able to unite them and hold them together, it's unclear whether or not the current leadership of all of these smaller groups are it have the clout to do so. So that's the, I suppose, the, the, the mitigating factor there to watch for. With Indonesia, frankly, the groups are incompetent, and that is to the benefit of the Indonesian security services, who are quite competent, so that's a, a relief. And their access to weaponry is quite limited. Their skills are incredibly limited. I think most government estimates put the number of Indonesians who went to fight in Marawi and therefore could have gleaned some skills at, at most 20. And whether or not those people survived and were able to make it back into Indonesia remains quite low. Indonesia in the past 
three years has seen one significant attack in 2018 with the Surabaya bombings. But since then, there was a massive, massive crackdown on the JAD network that facilitated those attacks. And therefore, the network of pro-Islamic state groups remains quite limited. Simultaneously, you have groups that are not affiliated with the Islamic State that are much older and have much deeper roots in Indonesia, such as the Jama Islamia and the Darul Islam, who remain active, but again, do not have the access to weaponry and resources to be able to pose a credible threat to Indonesian society. Great. Thanks so much for providing us with such an interesting insight into the world of Southeast Asian militant propaganda. And Southeast Asian militants in general, I mean, I know I, for one, wasn't aware that the Abu Sayyaf group was a network. But yeah, we'll talk more about that now. You'll be staying on the line with us now as we turn to the final section of our podcast, our cultural discussion on the Battle of Marawi. Before we get started, Judith, um, I know we briefly mentioned it, but could you give us a brief summary of the Battle of Marawi and the individuals that led it and maybe um, something on its broader significance in Southeast Asian militant Islamism? So the Battle of Marawi was said to have begun on the 23rd of May 2017, but the lead up to this battle was quite protracted. We saw between, I would say, mid-2016 and May 2017, an increase in attacks by groups in the Philippines who were vying for IS recognition. There were calls from these groups to other IS supporters in the Southeast Asian region, particularly Indonesians, to join them in their fight, particularly if they couldn't make it to Syria or Iraq. Um, There was also an increasing unification of these groups under Hapilon's leadership in Basilan and then subsequently Lano del Sur before they began their takeover of Marawi. These groups had probably been planning to stage their attack and takeover of the city at the end of Ramadan, so they could do what Baghdadi did and stand up in front of a congregation at the end of Ramadan and say that, hello, this is our our new caliphate. See, this is Allah's will shining down upon us or something like that. But because the Philippine armed forces had credible intel as to where Hapilon was hiding out in Marawi and launched a raid on the 23rd of May, they began their assault on the town earlier than probably they were planning for. There was, as I was saying earlier, involvement from militants from other parts of the region, such as Indonesians and Malaysians, but those numbers were not particularly large, though I will say that the figures provided are quite unreliable. Most regional government estimates suggest that there were 20 Indonesians who went, maybe a handful of Malaysians, but their role seemingly was about financial linkages with Islamic State affiliated groups in their respective nations and with Syria itself. A key figure in this financial network was a man called Dr. Muhammad, who provided a lot of funding from Syria via Indonesia and Malaysia, and then through those nations into Marawi itself. The other significant groups to consider within this fight, we have, like I said, Hapilon, who was leading a pro-Islamic State faction of the Abu Sayyaf in Basilan, but there's also the Maute group who were founded by two brothers, Omar and Abdullah Maute, and they are members of a fairly wealthy and well-connected family in a town of Butig. And they had studied abroad in the Middle East and they had come back and started to recruit and indoctrinate young people within their town. And a lot of this is grounded against a backdrop of 40 years of Moro insurgency against the Philippine state and the military's repressive tactics in these towns like Butig and in the wider Mindanao region. Initially, uh, the Mautes, I think, had tried to form an alliance with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, one of the main Moro liberation groups in the Philippines. But the MILF has subsequently entered peace talks with the government and successfully um, in in many ways disarmed and uh, forming a legitimate government of the region. The MILF, the best acronym out there, I suppose, for any terrorist organization, uh, did not want to work with the Maute brothers and thus sent them down a path to liaise and form alliances with much more extreme and increasingly Salafist and uh, pro-IS supporting organizations 
such as factions within the Abu Sayyaf and the BIF, the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters, who also pledged allegiance to Islamic State in 2014, um, who were themselves a breakaway faction from the MILF. Uh, so again, an alphabet soup of organizations uh, that were involved in this takeover. Great. Well, thank you for that informative overview. Um, so we've all watched two documentaries on the battle, and I think it would be interesting for us to discuss kind of the main themes that we thought they touched on and the questions that they raised for all. Uh, so the first of the two was an episode of the Philippine investigative journalism show Brigada, which focuses on two members of the Philippine military's combat camera team in documenting the Battle of Marawi. We see in the footage filmed through a GoPro what those final weeks of operations were like for soldiers, as well as the toll it can take on their families and their mental health. Um, this documentary also focused on the widespread damages in the city, which essentially, even after the battle was over, made it unlivable. Secondly, we watched a documentary by Philippine news network Rappler entitled Marawi, 153 Days of War. This one is split up into 12 sections. Some are an introduction to the conflict, the taking of Christian hostages, the intricacies of urban warfare, and how civilians have attempted to regain some normalcy in their lives. Um, the links to both of these documentaries will be provided in the episode description if any of our listeners are keen to watch them. So to kick it off and linking it to the main theme of this podcast, I think we should note that propaganda is an important aspect of any conflict and it's used by multiple parties involved. The Combat Camera Team documentary um, included many of these propaganda elements. Um, the majority of the documentary showed not only mopping operations near the end of the conflict, where security forces had a slight upper hand, as opposed to, you know, the intense and, and costly fighting. Yeah, and in that documentary, there was a heavy emphasis on the killings of Isnalon, Hapalon, and Omer Maude. Um, the documentary showed footage of their bodies being dragged through the streets via um, UAV footage. Uh, yeah, I thought that that element of the footage was really interesting. There was that real air of the uh, triumphalism and um, a desire to showcase the uh, you know the victory that had been won by the yeah you know, the Philippine armed forces in that conflict. Yeah, I, I I agree, Matt. I also think it's important to maybe discuss some as we've been doing some of the specificities of the region and the conflict and the way that Islamist militancy is practiced in the Philippines, as we saw in these documentaries. Judith, if you could kind of um, answer, you know, how how much did they tell us in these documentaries about those specificities? I mean, how much can we learn from them? Um, yeah, I think that this is actually pretty unusual, uh, mainly because of the scale. Like, this has not been seen in the Southeast Asia region for a very, very long time. The last time an Islamist group held territory, perhaps of the size or the significance, you'd have to look back to the Darul Islam rebellions in the late 1940s to 1962, 65 in Indonesia, where you'd have the Darul Islam um, taking over parts of West Java. So the territorial stronghold that they were able to establish in a town is quite significant. And simultaneously, even though groups in the Philippines have had territorial strongholds on smaller islands, let's say like in um, Jolo in the Sulu Sea, these are usually like jungle training camps in a way that uh, having control of a city again is, or uh, I guess a town is, is quite significant in that regard. And so I would say that, yeah, to, to go back to your question, it's um, the scale is unique. The level of quasi-urban combat is also unique and something that you, I guess, the Philippine armed forces were in no way expecting because they're used to fighting, again, in the jungles, in having a sort of more guerrilla-style warfare or non-conventional conflict in non-urban spaces with these uh, fighters. But now you're seeing this take place in a city. You've got hostages at play. You've also got a population that seemingly supported a lot of the actions taken by these groups. Uh, and whether or not that is because they have few options or because, again, like of long-standing grievances with the central government and that's bound up in ethnicity and religion, that, I suppose, that element of it comes through. They were quite candid about that in, I mean, certainly in the in the Rappler documentary, but also to an extent in the uh, in the Brigada documentary too. You're know, highlighting the extent to which the security forces just were not in any way kind of prepared for that kind of fighting and for the way in which the militants were then able to 
adapt to that and exploit, I guess, that unfamiliarity with, with urban warfare and that, you know, what they call kind of combat in, in an urban space. I think it was quite interesting the different ways in which the the military response was portrayed in the two documentaries. I think what was really kind of shocking from the the Brigada Combat Camera Team documentary was, you know, you could see very up up close the scale of the destruction here you know, in the commercial area of of Marawi, where a large amount of the fighting had taken place, but it didn't kind of give much detail as to how that destruction had taken place. And it was only really if you what if you kind of either knew about the fighting or if you then watched the, the Rappler documentary, you actually saw you know, that fairly extensive use of airstrikes, of artillery strikes to target fighters who were you know emplaced in you know dug in positions in buildings, etc. And and that's what generated you know that large part of you know the widespread destruction to those key commercial areas. Yeah. And it highlights, I suppose, the sort of resentment that would be generated in the aftermath of this. Like there is a very good um, Washington Post article that sort of goes back to the city and goes back to the camps where all of the refugees have been held or the internally displaced people have been held two years on. And there's very, very little uh, development from there. It seemed that the response initially was not only one that was unprepared for the sort of combat, but the initial choice to respond with huge amounts of firepower was seemingly very, very disproportionate and designed almost almost as if it was designed to engender even more antipathy towards the central government. Yeah, you've got to wonder to what extent they fought to win the battle, but might end up kind of losing the war in that regard. I mean, I think both documentaries stressed the importance of rebuilding, rehabilitation, and trying to not just rebuild the city, but also you know, from a, on an ongoing perspective to clamp down on the, I guess, the sources of the grievances that that led you know, large parts of not just you know, the, the fighters, but members of the population to support the militants and try and prevent something like this happening again. But as yeah. you say, you know, there's that great Washington Post bit. There's also been documentaries or kind of short videos by various international news outlets kind of touring Marawi and these um, IDP camps as of June, July, just last year, showing that, you know, large parts of you know, those commercial part of the city remains a complete no-go, that it's still being cleared from a security perspective and, you know, from a, a rebuilding perspective, let alone any approach towards, you know, reopening, rebuilding the city, et cetera. Yeah, I would say just to link it to our discussion earlier about the kind of propaganda that we see online from these groups, there is very, very limited theologically driven propaganda, if we could call it that, from pro-IS supporters in the Philippines. If you compare that to what the Indonesians provide, there's a lot of theological documentation, a lot of sermons and statements that are very conservative, but not necessarily pro-militancy, and a lot of debate in that space that you just don't see in the Philippine sphere. I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of the grievances that are driving the militancy and the conflict in the southern Philippines, less about the ideology, even though that is important to figures like um, Abdul and Omar Maute, a lot of the support from the community and from their rank and file comes from a real disdain at the way that their community has been treated and frankly suppressed over the last well, decades by the Philippine state. I think an important thing that was kind of hammered home by the Rappler documentary that wasn't really at all mentioned in the Combat Camera Team documentary was the role that, the, yeah, as you say, that the government has played in, I guess, not exacerbating the crisis, but certainly not, certainly not kind of acting to assist with the diffusing of these grievances. I mean, as we've kind of already discussed in this episode, the Malte group in particular kind of emerged as kind of a splinter of the MILF, you know, as a radical portion of that who didn't want to kind of commit to the MILF's, uh, you know, progress in the peace talks towards a, you know, an agreement for a limited degree of, uh, you know, self-rule and autonomy in Mindanao. But I thought what was really interesting in the, yeah, in the Rappler documentary was that, uh, yeah, there was an interview with a, you know, a senior member of the, MILF, um, you know, peace process negotiation team who made clear that from his perspective, it was the government's kind of ongoing delay in ratifying the Bangsamoro basic law 
So, you know, the outcome of the peace agreement that the MILF had signed with the government that was essentially helping to transfer legitimacy away from the MILF and more towards these more fundamentalist splinter groups who opposed the idea of a negotiated peace process. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to strip this entirely of international context. Like, it, just to be clear, like Omar and Abdullah Maute and the other Abu Sayyaf and pro IS factions that were involved in this coalition of forces that took over, like the leadership does believe in the Islamic State project. Like, the whole point of embarking on this takeover was to gain recognition from IS Central Command, if we can call it that for an East Asian province uh, designation. This was a big effort to show that, hey, we can hold territory, we have territory, uh, we support the caliphate in this regard. So there is, at least in the upper echelons of these organizations, a ideological commitment to a very, very particular form of uh, Islam and a commitment to Islamist militancy, fundamentally. I think um, we kind of already referenced in the um, in the discussion earlier the fact that you know, they were maybe hoping to try and launch this offensive at the end of Ramadan to kind of you know, emulate what the Islamic State had done with the capture of Mosul. There were some other kind of interesting parallels in terms of ways that they operated and the steps they kind of took in the operation. So, I mean, at a very kind of base level, acting to destroy kind of Christian iconography and parts of the churches, etc. But also, I think in some of the ways they were operating from a tactical perspective, they'd evidently been either directly or indirectly you know, transfer of, of knowledge in terms of how to operate when you're a, you're a non-state armed group holding territory, trying to defend it from an advancing force, which is technologically and numerically kind of superior. So both documentaries kind of went into pretty good depth in terms of the extensive use of both snipers and and IEDs by defending forces in Marawi that um, drastically slowed down the ability of advancing um, Filipino armed forces to recapture territory. You're saying you know, it's a case of having to go building by building and taking you know best part of a day, two days to clear through individual buildings, and that echoed a lot of the fighting that we saw in places like Raqqa and Mosul um, in previous years when the Islamic State was defending those cities. So I think there were a lot of interesting kind of parallels there. And I think evident that they were either in direct communication with, yeah, with senior members of the leadership of, of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or that they had kind of learned the lessons or seen the successful ways in which um, the Islamic State had managed to drag out uh, the defense of those cities from advancing adversary forces. Yeah. So the research, I mean, it's fairly limited at this stage because also very few um, scholars have, have had access to this region in any real meaningful way uh, since the siege ended. Um, seems to suggest that the training, if you could call it that, in the lead up to the siege focused primarily on paramilitary training sessions. They would last generally about a month or two for new recruits. And they focused primarily on weapons training. So again, how to how to load and fire your gun properly, uh, physical fitness, getting people into a state where they could sustain themselves against, like you said, a much more superior force. They were prepared for that, as well as some ideological indoctrination. But that was seemingly quite limited that they were, again, a lot of these, these men have either no education or elementary level education. So there were no long seminars in the way that that would have taken place for let's say, Indonesians who fought in the Afghan Jihad back in the 1980s. This was very much a military training exercise that they were preparing for. The conflict lasted over four months. So, Judith, I'm, I'm wondering, how did these militants actually obtain so many weapons and supplies to last them for such a long time? Yeah, so that is a, a really interesting phenomenon, I guess. So some of it was obtained domestically. There were a lot of... Um, robberies of local ATMs in the region and of small shops and even banks. And it seems that the authorities didn't put these things together, that these were all being done. Uh, these were not general criminal activities, but these were being done in service of funding and facilitating a much larger ideological conflict there. And then you also had a fair bit of support from 
uh, Islamic State in Syria. And that, like I said, was done through a Malaysian connection. And this money was being funded through Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, historically, Malaysia has played a role in facilitating a lot of terrorist activity from Islamist groups as a financial hub, even though they do not necessarily see high levels of Islamist violence at all there. Um, and Judith, thank you for that. Well, just one last final question. Um, so we saw in the documentary that the government allocated $1 billion dollars in rebuilding the city after the conflict was over. But as of June 2019, not much progress had been made. If civilians can't be returned to their normal lives, and if we know that as around 2,400 people were displaced, is there a likelihood of further radicalization? I know you touched upon the cultural and, and religious undertones of, of the conflict, but do you think that within the six to 12 month outlook, we might see a resurgence? Yes, uh, I would say that if you look at the interviews with participants of the conflict, the sort of rank and file uh, individuals, um, a lot of them were enamored or taken with the idea of joining a jihad, that there was something romantic about this notion. But they fundamentally understood that this was a local fight that was meant to improve the conditions and livelihoods of the people in their city. This was not necessarily seen as a idea of a global jihad of the kind fought by the Islamic State or even Al-Qaeda. And so if the local grievances that are fueling the rank and file joining persist, it stands to reason that there's no reason why these groups who are much more ideologically motivated can capitalize on that for future activity. Great. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you so much, Judith, for um, for taking the time to speak with us and to answer all of these questions. Um, we really appreciate it. No problem. So that brings us to the end of today's podcast. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and I hope that everyone enjoyed it. Um, if you have any feedbacks or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can find all of our contact details in the episode description. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. Once again, I'd like to offer a massive thank you to Judith for joining us um, and for the team for participating. For a little bit more information about what JTIC does, to learn more about our militant propaganda analysis product, or for any other information, go to james.com forward slash terrorism. Thanks once again from everyone here. Till next time. Bye bye.